And the Oscar goes to... Oh, no. Crash. Chris, why would you do that to us? <laughs> oh, That's coming in hot. So coming mean. in hot. That's so mean. Yeah. Uh, PTSD, uh, anybody? I remember that. I remember that night. And vividly. I, I vividly remember it. And I remember saying to myself... Um, I no longer will ever respect the Oscars ever. <laughs> and to this oh day, God. I don't respect the, I mean, I sort of do. I'm lying, but like, yeah, yeah. It just, mm-hmm. that was that moment. I was like, Oh, none of this means anything because it's oh, yeah. just like, it's obviously like, broke back. Mountain is like infinitely better than crash. Right. Right. I'm saying that nobody watches crash anymore. Thank you. No. Yes. Well, Thank nobody you. liked it then. It's, it's no, the, nobody liked like, it then either. Or, oh, God. There was um, like a blip in the radar, I feel, though, where somebody tried to rehabilitate it. The, you're right. And that did happen. I remember it, this. It got shut down. Are but, you sure like, it was that know. crash and not the other <laughs> the crash? Other, the, the other James Spader <laughs> yeah, yeah. crash? <laughs> I remember uh, I once got assigned to write an article about crash and then how it was controversial. So I thought, oh, yeah, you want me to talk about the Oscars and how that was a horrible snub. And then they yeah. came back and they said, no, 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 the sexy one. And I go, oh, but that's just like, it's controversial because it's sexy, but so what? But come on, let's bash the yeah. other crash. The, se- the sexy one. Uh, uh, all right. Well, we have our guest. Amanda, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us who you are. Tell us what you're all about. Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Amanda Jane Stern, and I am a Brooklyn based uh, writer, actor, producer. I used to write a column called Queerly Ever After, where I focused on LGBTQ plus movies with romantic happy endings. Um, I also write for Provoker, where I write a column called Anatomy of a Sex Scene, where I focus on the filming of sex scenes and whether they were done in a manner that was safe for the cast and crew or not. Um, And then I'm a filmmaker. I have a movie, Perfectly Good Moment, which is an erotic thriller that is hopefully making the festival circuit soon. Very cool. Welcome to the show. I uh, appreciate you being here. This is awesome. Yes. Uh, you are. The, it sounds like you are the perfect person for this episode, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. And I, I, I have to admit this. I was pleasantly surprised when you reached out to us because that's the first time somebody's reached out to us to come on the show. And oh, really? Yeah. And, I was, and it was just like a whole new level of, oh, okay. So somebody's actually interested in this kind of weird idea that we have for exploring a subgenre. Well, um, we'd had, we'd, we'd somehow, I don't know who found whom, but followed each other on, on Twitter at sure. some point. And I'd been listening to, um, your episode. So right after I wrapped post, my director says, okay, you need to start plugging the movie and start doing <laughs> podcasts. Yeah. So I was Here looking through like, what do I want to go on? Who do I want to talk <laughs> I to? You, I love that we were on that list. I love that. That's fantastic. <laughs> Amazing. Um, um, what are we doing today? So this is for oh romance. We are in yes. the two thousands. Should we cover it? We did the sixties Lolita taste of honey. 1970s we did Badlands, Harold and Maud. The 1980s we did Valley Girl, My Beautiful Laundrette. Uh, love that movie. Very, very good movie. I love and My man, Beautiful Laundrette so much. It's so great. Actually, connection to Secretary, which is one of our movies. Oh, uh, I, I will be bringing Laundrette up today. Fantastic. I love <laughs> it. Nice. Excellent. And then, excellent. Chris, you did uh, uh, Bound and Poison Ivy for the 90s. So we have, uh, for the 2000s, Brokeback Mountain is our main film. And then kind of our chaser film is Secretary. How do we want to dive into this one? Um, did we all see Brokeback when it came out? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I did. Yes. Uh, yeah. You guys seen it in theater? I remember saying, yeah. I remember going, I, remember uh, seeing it like, I don't know, like January 2006, maybe? Yeah, it was like a dead summer release. It was super buzzy. Uh, oh, was my mom buzzy. is a member of BAFTA and had yeah. a BAFTA screener. So I watched oh, the screener wonderful. with her at home. <laughs> Oh, nice. Nice. Watermarked? Watermarked? Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Good. Good. Of course. <laughs> um, pre, I, pre-streaming. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I have a pretty strong memory specifically because like, I was dating uh, who my girlfriend at the time who ended up becoming my wife. And it was definitely like one of those moments. Like, And I had just recently met her parents. We'd been dating for a couple of years. And... Uh, and like, just like, you know, I guess 
my wife had told her dad that I was like really into movies or whatever. And so then he, and he's, you know, he's, he's actually pretty progressive when it comes to a lot of like sexuality, gender stuff. But, um, it was just like this classic, like awkward moment between <laughs> Wait, like, really? okay. boyfriend yeah. And father-in-law, where he's like, "Oh, well, you seen any good movies lately?" I was like, "Oh yeah, Justin and I just saw Brokeback Mountain, and it's good as that, as good as everybody's saying it is." Yeah, and he's like, oh, yeah. "Broke, broke back the 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 gay cowboy movie, <laughs> of course, uh, as it was." Uh, and it was just like you know, even like the most liberal, uh, you know, upstanding people still had like a really strong reaction, yeah, to this film. Yeah, I remember um, that. I remember it was two thousand five, right yeah, the very end like, of it. Exactly. Yeah. It was like, yeah, there was like this tremendous buzz around it, but there was, yeah, there was sort of like, was there controversy really? Was that what we call that? Or was it just an uncomfortableness? Like what was it all about? There were angry people. There always will be. So, you know, Mm -hmm. but, and it was, it was, it was like a it was like a casual anger too, I think, Mm -hmm. where it was like, you know, at that point, I feel like, even the the most bigoted people like had come to expect this kind of thing from Hollywood. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, Cause they had oh, their yeah, own yeah. conspiracy theories, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm curious to hear like, cause I had watched it a couple more times after the fact, uh, uh-huh. but this was definitely like compared to the other rewatches we've done recently for the show. Like this is one where it's like, it's been a minute. Oh really? Um, yeah. If only because yeah. like, it is, it's an engrossing watch. It's a very rewarding watch, yeah. but it is tough, right? Very and tough. I'm curious, Brutal. I'm curious to hear from you, Amanda, in particular, since you had this column where you would focus on LGBTQ <laughs> stories that had happy endings. Yes. yes. Um, where does this fit into that? And I don't know if you can kind of give us like a, a broader view as well, because I feel like that's been a big part of the conversation regarding LGBTQ cinema over the past decade or so is like, where's the joy? Where's the, mm-hmm. you know, the positive representation, not just representation, period. Not just bury your gaze. Yeah, yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when, <laughs> when this one came out, bring us back to 2005, um, there's definitely, if you if you read a lot of retrospectives on it right now, you'll see a lot of people claim how it was the first mainstream movie to depict gay men in any sort of positive manner. That's hmm. not true yeah. at all. Sure. Um, the first, if we're going to go real mainstream, major Hollywood studio, like the big names, uh, 20th Century Fox in 1982 did Making Love, which... Oh, yeah, I don't know that one. Of, exactly. That, I no, know. I've never, never seen it. Never seen it. I've never heard of it. And there's a reason for that. So it came out in 1982. It came out in theaters across the states. Didn't do great because straight people went and then they go, what? This is a gay movie? And a lot of gay men went and said, well, this doesn't represent me. This isn't how I live my life. And there are some quotes from the screenwriter talking about how, you know, he could only write what represented himself. Yeah. Um, But when it is the one and only movie, you have to be representative of an entire community. The other thing about that movie is that it came out right before AIDS, literally right on the cusp. So when you, you saw it in theaters, that was starting. And so we had this kind of weird time post Stonewall between 69 and 82, where there was sort of an opening up for cinema major studio indie studio to be a little more LGBTQ positive. And then once that happened, once, you know, post 82 come into the eighties and that really went away specifically for gay men in 85, we get, you know, desert hearts and the yeah. wonderful breakthrough. That was my beautiful yes. laundrette, which was actually yeah. a shocker. You yeah. know, it was, it was made for television and then yeah. for ITV and then went to a festival, did super well and got a major theatrical release and was nominated for an Oscar, which is why in 87 when, um, Merchant Ivory did Morris. They thought, well, hey, Laundrette did so well, so we're good. We can do this. And then it it kind of flopped and did okay yeah. here in the States, didn't do well in the UK. And now it's this 
poignant cult beloved film. Yeah. So history in a nutshell. And it's also, (laughs) (laughs) it's also not Ang Lee's first movie where his main characters are gay men. He did um, the wedding banquet in 1993. Yeah. Um, So a lot of the other ones just kind of get forgotten by history. And I kind of have a theory about that. This survived not only because Ang Lee's amazing. It's a beautiful heartbreaking movie but i think that's part of why it survived it's that we allow it to become famous when it's tragic especially yeah. in 05 yeah definitely and i think that's the you know i remember seeing this um right when it came out and you know i was very curious from the hype and just sitting through it i mean it it reminds me a lot of another michelle williams movie uh uh, Blue Valentine, mm-hmm. where oh, it's just. I was going to say Manchester by the Sea. <laughs> that, God, she's in a lot of. <laughs> she, she likes to be in really movies. depressing films. She yeah. likes to cry. She likes mm-hmm. to cry. Yeah. Um, she, is good. she is good at it. Yeah, yeah. She's a great actress. <laughs> oh, she's phenomenal. And I don't know, like this movie, I would say I probably watch this movie once every like couple of years. Really? Um, yeah, oh, it's one of my favorite movies by far. I think it is one of the best love stories I've ever seen put on screen, hands down. Um, And it's just, I don't know, there's something about, uh, it's also, I think the way that they show love and how it plays out, um, like the tragedy of it seems very, very realistic to me. Right. Uh, In the sense that like, oh, you know, like you can love somebody and have be loved back, but it never happens. You know, it never really comes to fruition in, in a sense. Um, and so the, uh, yeah, that aspect of it. I, so I've, I've, yeah, I, every time I watch this movie, I absolutely, it's also a, a great emotional release for me because every time I watch it, it's an absolute crier every time, uh, especially yeah. like the last 10 minutes, I'm just like bawling. Yeah. Um, so I, that's, I mean, to me, it's like one of those movies and I, I, when I first saw it, it was like that too. It was like this immediate sort of emotional, it was like, this is unbelievable. Um, what do you guys, I mean, what's your sort of everybody's background with Ang Lee? I mean, I love Ice Storm is one of those movies that just sort of like stays oh with me for like, you know, I saw it back when it came out and then I guess it's like, how, when did that come out in the nineties, 97, I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that one stuck with me too. He's just, there's something about the, the quietness of his films that just sort of mm-hmm. linger for some reason. Right. Um, and, and you and match that here the with silence breathe. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And letting sort of the, the scene sort of play out and it's um, with this one specifically, the, the Western um, setting and stuff, it just really lends itself to uh, an engrossing watch overall. And I do think like w- my own history ha- kind of circled back with me before we rewatched broke bag for this episode, because um, I had, I was really curious to go back and watch crashing tiger, hidden dragon. Um, and I last year had a lot of students that were fascinated by like Hong Kong cinema and, uh, that history. And so I, I let my students vote on what movie we watch next. And so I put that on the ballot when we were talking about like action adventure films and Mm -hmm. they voted nearly unanimously to watch it. And it was just, that was, that was really special because typically with like a teenage audience, I, uh, I can't get them to like sit and really get uh, enraptured by a, by something that is pretty slow, even for you know a, a movie with lots of you know detailed fight scenes that also has that quietness to it, right? Oh um, yeah, this kind of, of like yeah. domestic nature of the relationships between the characters in between all the you know incredible set pieces and. And that's really what I recall the most. Like you said, Ice Storm. I remember seeing that on like an HBO free trial. And then uh, <laughs> Crouching Tiger, of course, blew up. And then, um, but then Hulk oh, happened. So bad. So, <laughs> so bad. Three. But he, he had a chance to really, do this movie first and mm-hmm. he decided to do it, Hulk instead. Exactly. But then, and that, oh, this was God. something I had no idea until doing research for this recording is that. Um, shortly after he did Hulk and he understandably just felt like yep. ripped apart <laughs> by it. God, um, yeah. and he was talking with his father 
uh, and his father basically said, Aang, you, you have to make a movie. Like, not don't like go do a big spectacle thing. Like, you do a movie like you know how to do a movie. Like, it's something small, something important, something intimate. Mm-hmm. And uh, then two weeks later, Aang Lee's father passed away. And he oh, kind of wow. took that as the sign to finally say, like, okay, I, it's time for me to do Brokeback. Yeah. Um, and it's like that's part of the deal with like kind of how I feel split on um, what you were saying, Amanda, with like mm-hmm. the the tragic nature of it and how that really kind of messes with um, the way that uh, mainstream society has treated its stories about um, gay protagonists yeah. and versus <laughs> like Ang Lee clearly like that tragedy feels palpable. Um, not just with the characters and the fiction, but also like with what he's personally putting into it. And so it's like, uh, it, it, it sucks that it kind of snowballed into this big after effect, but like yeah. if you're able to, and I'm not sure you're able to really like divorce it from that, but like if you just look at it for face value, like it's, it does not seem like there was any ill intentions by the filmmakers or actors or any cast and crew and like trying to be like, this is going to be the movie that breaks it big because we're going to have a hate crime happen at the end of the film. You know, no, I don't think there were, I think they were well-intentioned. I think what it is, is, and <laughs> knowing Ang Lee's, you know, own tragedy going into it makes me feel bad saying this, but I think it kind of goes to who, whose lens is this being told through and who is it for? Um, And to, to bring up, because yes, it's set from 1963 up into the 80s. Hate crimes were really, really bad. This is obviously not the urban, you know, it's not New York city. It's not Los Angeles. It's not San Francisco. It's Wyoming and Texas, which was, yes, terrible to be a gay man back then but at the same time there always were gay people who made it and and figured out how to do what jack wanted to do and live their lives and and that's why i think that this is very much so told by straight people and through a straight lens for straight people whereas if you take something like Morris, which is based on the E.M. Forster novel, which is set in the very early 1900s. It came out after his death. It has a happy ending because it was written by a gay man who wanted to see a story that not only didn't end in tragedy, but also reflected some of the people he actually knew. And it's based on a real couple that he knew who just did it. And they, they lived together for decades and it's the same with, you know, Carol, which was based on the price of salt, which is yeah, also yeah. a period mm-hmm. piece. And it, but it's still being told through that lens of saying, yes, I know there's tragedy in my life. I don't need to reflect that back in a book or on screen. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. Oh, and, the, and the original sort of source of this story is, um, a short story in the New Yorker, mm-hmm. um, by Annie Heisner Peru. Is that right? Um, I don't know. I think that's right. I think, I think so. Like, uh, um, yeah, but- and so it's already it's already has a lens that's not from a gay man, right? Mm-hmm. It's starting out that way. And the two people that pick it up, um, you know, they're obviously neither of them are uh, you know, gay either. So it's sort of like we're already sort of stacking the deck for a yes. lens okay. that is not gonna be necessarily reflective of the main characters, right? Um, which is like, you know, it's tough then at that point. Um, to really sort of have it speak uh, in a certain way to uh, a group of people or be representative because it's really mm-hmm. not at the end of the day. Um, and it is a, and, a beautiful, uh, tragic love story. But I yeah. always find that when I need to revisit something that's kind of give me, that's going to give me that same emotional kind of crescendo, but not leave me so raw, I yeah. guess, mm-hmm. I'll watch um, God's Own Country. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I, the thing, the thing that complicates us even more is that in particular, Jake Gyllenhaal's put his foot in his mouth a lot. <laughs> oh my God. The, his yeah. interviews. What's going on? Uh, yeah. Just like say, uh, you know, he, there's a lot of them out there. The one that I noted was, um, 
just from last year. And like, I thought we already like had this discussion and put it to bed several times over the past several years where he says, uh, I think it's very important to both of us to break the stigma of two great gate, two straight guys playing the parts. Um, and then he says, I think it's led the way towards people saying, you know, people of all different experience should be playing more roles. And then, you know, it just like recalls the horrible, like, internet meme of like Scarlett Johansson playing a tree or whatever, you know, <laughs> where it's like it, it, that kind of, um, that kind of blindness is important to like take note of. Um, oh, yeah. and then like the, yep. the, the, the elephant, one of the elephants in the room that we're not talking about is obviously like Heath Ledger's passing and it, you know, what, what could have been, um, some maybe more, I don't know, would it, would he have, reflected on. i i i like jake gyllenhaal a lot as an actor but i do think heath ledger's a smarter person <laughs> probably i think so too from what i've read about even when they were making the movie heath ledger was the one who was a lot more conscious yes. of what the movie was about and saying hey you apt like i do not want anyone making gay jokes on this set that is absolutely not okay with me yeah yeah and no. like i remember there was an instance where he had put his foot down because someone did. He said, no, like we're going to stop shooting and you're going to apologize for that. We're not doing this. Yeah. That's huge. Um, and what do you think? Like, uh, taking it more from the audience's point of view and especially with the kerfuffle of the Oscars and everything, <laughs> oh, yeah. what, like what, what happened? Like it had it, it speaking of crescendo, like it felt like there was like this huge, just like outpouring. Like it was like the height of the cultural zeitgeist. Yeah. And then it just like, ugh, sorry, pun not intended, uh, comes crashing down. <laughs> right. Yeah, when... Well, I mean, it, it, ultimately <laughs> like this is what focus features, right? Yep. Yes. So, it, and who was crash? Was crash like Miramax or something? Who was crash? Yeah. Was yeah it? I it was. <laughs> it's a Weinstein production. Was it oh. really? Great. Uh, yeah, like, yeah. It, it just, cool. I remember when did this happen before? Like, I want to say, oh no, it was Lionsgate. Lionsgate. Um, okay. <laughs> well, that's just, oh, that's actually okay. crazy now that I'm thinking about it. Lionsgate won an Oscar? Like, that's right. What? Well, well, they I, used to be I, a joke I think studio. It's yeah. more about the Academy patting themselves on the back. It, you know, mm, it's, yeah. see, we nominated the gay movie, which admittedly was the good movie. Um, yeah. but we're going to give it to the one where, where it's kind of like white people forget forgiving themselves for racial insensitivities <laughs> yes. yeah, because yeah, how yes. many people of color do you think were in the Academy in Oh five? I mean, there's only what yeah. one now. Yeah, exactly. It was yeah. not, yeah. uh, it, but it was also like, it, it, it felt to me like the whole game of winning an Oscar, mm -hmm. which I go back to like, when was <sighs> Was it like Saving Private Ryan versus like Shakespeare in Love? Am I thinking about this right? <laughs> that's a Weinstein thing. That yeah, was that's a Weinstein, Weinstein thing. Yeah. That's why I was like yeah. stuck in my head. Or it's like that sort of like, well, like this doesn't make any sense. No. Nope. But it's like, yeah. I think it, it just opened up, that whole thing opened up to my, my eyes to like, I didn't realize the Oscars were like, and no one in the public realizes this for the most part. It's like, uh, it's people voting in a club essentially. Mm -hmm. And it yeah, has yeah. no bearing whatsoever on what people like or dislike. That has nothing to do with it. It's all insider, inside baseball, the whole thing. Politics. Um, it's politics. That's it. Yeah, exactly. And so I think, and that's the thing that is interesting that why Brokeback didn't sort of like, I, I feel like in that environment, um, it would have done maybe better than it did. But then you think back on, there's probably still rampant homophobia mm -hmm. in the Academy and just sort of in a certain sect of those people in power. It was like, we're not going to give it to this movie. I don't want this. Yeah, movie. I think a lot of them also want to say, see, we solved racism. See, yeah, we did it. Exactly. We're great. We did it. <laughs> it's over. We're done. We're, like, um, we're talking about the gay movie, but we don't have to give it the big award. We can just say we solved racism and give that the award. Yeah. And yes, we all now know. And we all knew then that, crash seriously <laughs> okay it's that's yeah. real sense it's of movie. Unwatchable. No, it's the, o the other phenomenon that happened around this time and has con has kind of continued at the oscars is like it almost feeling like there's going they're trying to like have their cake and eat it too like okay we'll give best director mm -hmm. to broke back Did because that, that was actually well right yeah yeah oh, um that's ridiculous and, but then, yeah, so then yeah. they can still say that they, you know, honored both. Um, 
But I mean, I, I going back to like the the production yeah. of this screenplay. Uh, yeah, you had very clearly privileged people all the way through, straight filmmakers all the way through, and yet it still like took forever to actually happen. Not only because yeah. Ang Lee, you know, passed on it initially until he came back to it after Hulk, but also the the screenwriters who adapted it like shopped this around a lot for like yeah. over four years. Um, and these are like rel- like Mary uh, Larry McMurdy is a pretty established like industry yeah. guy, yeah. and he couldn't even get it made. And actually, it wasn't even picked up until James Seamus, the producer, basically uh, had his company, Good Machine, uh, uh, get collapsed into focus. And so then he finds himself in the seat of being like, "Oh wait, now I can actually get this movie made." Yeah. So like. If the if that financial transaction hadn't gone through, we perhaps would have never even seen it come yeah. to the screen. And the budget was not high for this. I mean, they even say no. it's like it's listed as fifteen million. But I think it was actually pretty below that. Um, and, and it was tell- a huge success. It was, oh, it was and it, it definitely opened the door for more movies with queer protagonists to get made. Unfortunately, so many more of those movies were. Yeah. Well, let's just remake Brokeback. Yeah, which- exactly. I don't need remade anyway. You're not going to make it a better movie. Yeah, it's not going to happen. In terms of any of the production value. So do something different. Uh, and yeah. that they didn't. Um, no. Oh, my God. There's, there's actually there's a movie I reviewed in my column that does have a happy ending, and it's a terrible movie. So bad. <laughs> I think it's called Arizona Sky, and it is they're, – they're not cowboys, but it's set kind of in farmland, and there is a mm-hmm. – it's not a joke it's supposed to be a vaguely homophobic comment but yeah. the way that it, the script is written and every line is delivered you can't not laugh where one guy says to one of the leads are all of them cowboys them broken back cowboys now uh, what, 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 what. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how big yeah. the movie was right like it yeah. did have yeah. like this sort of like moment of where everybody across the board knew about the movie. They were interested in it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, it did become maybe a little bit of a punchline to some people. Um, yeah. But it did have, like, a big cultural moment. Uh, and it, it, I don't know. That's the one part I do find fascinating about, like, the fact that, um, you know, Ang Lee wanted to retire. He was like, I'm done. And then, like, you know, coming back around again, asking about this movie. He's like, has this movie been done yet? Have you done it? And the guy's like, no. All right, so let's try it. And, like, the number of people that were attached to this, Josh Hartnett, Ryan Felipe, yeah. uh, Matt Damon, uh, Gus Van uh, Zant was supposed to direct it. and then have, he you, have you read what Matt Damon said about not doing it? I, saw, I remember something. Do I want to know? It? So yeah. he said, I mean, okay, I remember this is the guy who just admitted that he only just stopped using the F word. Um, yeah, that's true. That's true. Good point. He said to Gus Van Zandt, Gus, I just did a gay movie. And then I did a cowboy movie. If I do a gay cowboy movie, that's all I can do. Oh, my oh God. God. Come on, Matt. You're better than that. But it was like, yeah, it was like a revolving <laughs> door of like, uh, a li- and then what they kept on saying essentially is that like, you know, someone would say, yeah, I'll do it. And then in a couple months and they dropped out. I think mm-hmm. people were getting cold feet about it. They weren't comfortable with it or whatever. Uh, but I always find it fascinating, like a movie like this that, you know, is it, I guess it's kind it's definitely more on the indie side of things. Um, how it just sort of comes together and just works. I think that's the thing too about the movie that stays with me is that you really could put on any scene and it and it's pretty just from a cinema lover's perspective, it's enthralling. Yeah. Right. The, the shots. It's gorgeous. The way it, yeah, it's just beautiful. And um I it, it always blows my mind that someone can take, you know, eleven million, twelve million dollars to make a movie like this and it looks so amazing. Right. And then you can have a hundred dollar <laughs> movie that looks like, you know, uh-huh. I don't know, like nothingness, just muck. It's, like, talent, like, how? it's how? talent and planning and actually <laughs> thinking about every single shot that you want to show. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, the, the I think one of the f- interesting things about that is that uh, they were able to pull this off. Not only a bunch of straight people making this 
gay story, but also like none of them really knowing how to film in the American West. Yep. There's like, <laughs> yeah. like they had no idea what they're getting themselves into. They tried Wyoming. They tried Montana. Um, they had to go to Calgary. So Canada solves everything once yeah. again, when it comes to film production. Thank you, but, Canada. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> um, but then they had to, uh, you know, kind of figure things out as they showed up on set with hundreds of sheep. And then they find out that Alberta is not going to let them take them into the mountains because yeah. that's like a, you know, it's a, that's a very dangerous set. Like we said, you could film here. We didn't say you could bring, you know, hundreds of sheep here. Uh, and so like, even with those kinds of glitches where it's like, you can imagine the kind of struggles that probably came from, you know, a bunch of, Hollywood people trying to film in this landscape and the lensing's perfect. That's not a problem, but the yeah. actual like logistics of it, especially with like how much time uh, this, the story spans, you know, yeah. with the, mm-hmm. and of course you've got like the, the behind the scenes uh, love story between Heath and Michelle um, happening as well. And uh, she ends up having their child, uh, you know, a year after. So you have like, this there's so much going on that should lend itself to just be like a chaotic oh, production total disaster. Yeah, it should be, but it, but it somehow just like ends up looking so stately and well put. Oh, like, that, it's just like, that's Lee. I mean, that's Ang Lee. I mean, yeah. like, right. He, he just has doing such it. control over it. I mean, it's like uh, to Amanda's point, like there's some, a quote here about pre-production which they say for Ang Lee is just like incredibly thorough and private. Yep. And that's one side mm-hmm. of him. Then the shooting side, he doesn't say anything at all. Right? <laughs> he just yeah. sort of lets them do their thing. Right. Um, and it, it was funny, like Keith Ledger's like reaction to that was just to go harder and to, <laughs> yeah. like, try and give more and more. And there's a great little story about, I think um, that Ang Lee talks about the scene where I can't remember what happens right, right before it, but Heath Ledger's like uh, in the alleyway. Uh, he's like punching the wall. Mm-hmm. Do you guys remember what happened right yeah. before that? Like the emotional. It, uh, yes. It's at the end of the summer uh, when Jack just leaves and then. Oh yeah. Right. He, 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 he doesn't know when he's going to ever see him again. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So taken yeah. by the emotions and ha- does not know how to let out his emotions in a healthy manner. So he starts yeah. punching a wall. Mm-hmm. Well, apparently on one of the takes, um, you know, Heath went pretty hard and his hand is like bleeding from punching the wall. Cause it's a real wall. It's not like a prop or anything. And, uh, Angley was like, oh, the cloud doesn't really look right here. <laughs> so he, and the producer's like, no, 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 you got to tell him to stop. This is too much, too much. But Angley, Angley goes up to Heath Ledger's like, can you just do one more for me, one more? And that's the shot that's in the movie. And Angley actually called oh. it his favorite shot of his entire career. Oh, my God. Because, like, the cloud's perfect. The yeah. cowboy that walks past kind of looks at him. Heath really goes at it. So it's like, yeah, there, yeah I mean, there is a madness in the craft of making a film, I think. Oh yeah. Um, and there's like a, an incredible dark side to that, um, mm-hmm. that, you know, can be uh, wrong power dynamics and uh, everything associated with that. But when it, it gets right and you have someone who, you know, is strong and powerful has a vision and is, you know, supportive of his cast and supportive of his crew, I think something like this can happen where it's just like, Oh wow, yeah. this it is really a clear vision. People who actually want to be there and, and also want to make a set, a, an environment that isn't just a, a toxic workplace, but something that yeah. can actually be a healthy environment and you're going to get something better made. Yeah. yeah. No, I think mm-hmm. that's, that's what we're seeing here. It's just like, wow. And, and speaking of perfect shots, I was just like, I, it was definitely like, a, a moment of like uh i i love cinematography when i originally saw it with uh heath just doing that roundhouse kick when the, with the fireworks oh in the background <laughs> um when i did the rewatch, shot. i was like this is ridiculous yes yes <laughs> oh my god um yeah and that's the thing it's like it's melodrama right and it's, it's like yeah it's like roundhouse <laughs> yeah there's there's the scenes house. like that yeah and, uh, and the other, western yeah. <laughs> exactly um and not even just like on the the violent side of things but like um almost like a it's it's very like uh theatrical mm-hmm. um the scene that really 
took me this time and I was just like, oh, I can't believe that scene isn't from like a classic 50s movie um, where uh, Jake Gyllenhaal and the father-in-law have that back and forth with oh turning on and off the TV. Oh, it's yeah, just yeah. it's just so immaculately staged with the pans and uh, uh, the character actor. Um, and then I just want to do a shout out quick because uh, obviously, yes, it's Ang Lee at the end of the day. It's his picture. But um, I didn't realize, I think, until having this conversation in depth, uh, the cinematographer um, doing the lensing on set is Rodrigo Pietro, who did some of the most beautiful lensing for Spike Lee in 25th Hour and mm-hmm. then also went on to um, do... Uh, Silence for Scorsese, which oh, okay. is also just like oh. incredible, beautiful landscapes. And he's doing this is the kicker. He's not only doing uh, lensing for Scorsese again for Killers of the Flower Moon coming up, but also Greta Gerwig's Barbie. So <laughs> oh, there you go. Playing both sides hey, of the sky rocks. Barbie should also have great cinematography. Absolutely. Yeah, it should. It will. It definitely will. Oh, um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, where do we think this movie stands now? Do you feel like, so there was a whole thing when it came out, we, we were all mm-hmm. there. We all sort of lived it. Um, mm-hmm. How has it aged? You know, we're what? Well, not 20 years. I guess we're what? I can't do my math. 17 years. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, 17 years on. So how is this, how is the cultural moment shifted here? And how, how are people viewing this movie now? Especially younger people. I'm curious. Chris, you might know because you teach film to young people. <laughs> would, would you, you know, right. what do you think that they would see Yeah. I mean, we, we, we talk about it briefly um, when we discuss romance, um, but it does yeah, seem does like... what does Gen Z think? <laughs> oh, yeah. my gosh. It does seem like that authenticity factor is still hugely important, especially mm-hmm. to the next generation, um, to the point where it's like... And I think we even had this conversation as recent as uh, one of Brokeback's big, I, I think, uh, uh, successors is Call Me By Your Name. Mm-hmm. And yes. yeah. uh, how that plays yeah. out with Chalamet and uh, Army Hammer, of well, all if people. We're, if we're going there, I have an Army Hammer not-so-fun fact for when we start talking about Secretary. Oh, oh then maybe okay. this will be our segue point. <laughs> it's a good segue. Here but, we yeah, go. But, but what is... What is uh, just to, to, to put a cap on that, and then I'm, I'm eager to hear this, uh, what, what we see is, like, it's just incredible that, like, we're so you know, more uh, vigilant and aware when um, we have conversations about like non-trans actors playing mm-hmm. trans characters yeah. mm-hmm. and uh, the whitewashing of characters of color. Um, but it still seems like, like who are the big name, who are, th- or do we have a list gay actors? We, I think feel like we have more a list lesbian actors than we do gay men actors. Am I wrong in that? Oh, that's an interesting huh. question. I guess in terms of, of big star bank ability, I can think of a few guys. Um, but I also, I think to that point, and I am an actor. I am also queer. Um, I'm, I'm bisexual. So I think, and I've had this conversation with other queer people in the industry, and I mm-hmm. completely understand the, hey, People with those lived experiences should play those roles. Yeah. It also, to that point, if you are forcing an actor who might not be ready to come out of the closet to take a role, I think that's a big problem. Is yes, I I think there needs to be authenticity in the role, and I think that needs to mean how are you approaching this? Are you approaching it as someone who's already a member of this community? Um, So you're taking a role that you know, that makes perfect sense. Are you a good ally or are you doing it? Because in the past it was the idea that you're brave for taking the gay role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing it because you want to be like, well, I want the award because I'm going to do the gay role. That's a problem. If you're a legitimate ally in the community taking on a role, I think that's fine. And I, I, and I also, you know, we don't know what people's sexualities are. We can't say definitively, Hey, that person's straight. And they took a bisexual character because maybe they really wanted to take that character because they're questioning their own sexuality and having an outlet to explore it through someone else enables them to come out. And we have seen that happen with many actors in the past. So I, I think that's the touchiness of the subject. Now, I don't think that extends to racial 
things or yeah. transgender characters because sexuality is not a visible true thing. Yeah. You don't just walk out on the street, you know, yes, you live your life. Your experiences are as a gay person, a bisexual person, a lesbian, yeah. a straight person, but that's not walking out and being a black man in this country. Those are yeah. wildly different things. And then I, I can look at you and physically say, well, that person is not a person of color. You yeah, know, that's a very good point. Yeah. And then yeah. with, you know, trans characters, we don't have cis men play cis women. Why on earth should cis men be playing trans yeah. women? Yeah. It, every other actor plays their own gender. Yeah. Right. That's a yeah, very yeah. Good point. yeah. Um, no, what's the what's the army yeah we gotta, we, we gotta oh. that. He's <laughs> us with the army hammer yes sorry okay <laughs> so um my uh, fiance was a producer on the army hammer documentary for discovery oh okay he was the archival producer yeah and something that is <laughs> he literally just walked out of the bedroom because he heard me say this um <laughs> but something that is in one of the episodes is that apparently all of the women that army dated mm -hmm. he made them watch and it's very telling but i think this is as far as he made it into the movie the opening scene with the stapler Oh my God. Oh, yeah. wow. Which is incredibly telling in the sense that he completely misunderstood the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. completely. Um, but that is <laughs> my fun fact. Okay. That is. Well, that Jake Gyllenhaal is a genius compared to Army Hammer. So. <laughs> allegedly. Yeah, I, I've allegedly. been told I have to well, say allegedly. allegedly. <laughs> it's allegedly. Everything's allegedly. We don't make anything <laughs> into that. Can be. <laughs> How allegedly. Do you guys have you guys come across a uh, secretary? How did you come across it, Amanda? I actually, Amy Hobby, who's one of the producers on it, I yeah. worked for her back in um, 2014. She yeah. started a production company called Tangerine Entertainment, and I worked there their opening summer. Very and she cool. was a, a producer and secretary. So before I started, I um, that was kind of like the big movie to her name. So I watched it. What did you think? Wow. I actually love it. And I, I think in many ways, it's an interesting pairing with Brokeback Mountain. Because as I mentioned, you know, who's telling the story? Who is it for? This is being mm -hmm. told. The director is a man. Yes. This yeah. is written by a woman. This yeah, is oh yeah. for yeah. a woman's view. This yeah. is a woman's fantasy. Is it problematic? Yeah. So what? Fantasies are problematic. <laughs> that's why it's a fantasy. That's okay. Yeah, that's the, fantasy that's doesn't have to be perfect. Like, that's the thing, like watching this now. I remember, Chris, we watched this together back in the day, right? We did. Yeah. We were, pro we were what, ni probably 19 years old? <laughs> yeah. 19, 20. Really, yeah. yeah suburban, cis, white, very boys closeted in... people in general, I would say, <laughs> from a very yeah. conservative place. <laughs> <sighs> and yeah, I mean, I th I've, it's amazing because I, I will say, rewatching this movie, I and I, I, I would actually call it a first watch because I don't think I had any clue about the world of the perspective of where this movie came from mm -hmm. to properly watch it as like a nineteen-year-old cis straight suburban boy, and that it was just super eye-opening to like rewatch it after years of like education and uh allyship and just like trying to better understand uh the world of not only um bdsm but everything from like uh self-mutilation to uh male gaze versus female gaze and i'm just like a, it's just kind of incredible how i feel like maybe this movie more so than any other it's like how do how could I have such a 180 on it because I feel like we were crudely like mocking and laughing off the film. Oh, we were watching it. Th that's a fact. Back like then. you were watching like we literally... it in like your Florida room. I remember, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, it was like a joke to us. Right. Like, we like rented we like it from idiots. Blockbuster. We were dumb. We we're like, oh, this is yeah. like some weird stuff. Like, let's watch this. Yeah. James Bond was funny. He was great in Stargate, but 
<laughs> exactly. Like that was kind of like the vibe. But I, I had the same uh, see, my, exact my reaction. Love of James Spader's sex lives and videotapes. So. Oh yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. But I, I when I rewatched this this last week, I was blown away by how much I loved it. Mm-hmm. Like absolutely blown away. Like there is so much going on in this movie that I had no idea back when we first saw it, and I have not seen it mm-hmm. since. This is the first time I've seen it in twenty years. And right. it wow. The nuance here <laughs> and the absolute tightrope walking mm-hmm. that happens with James Spader and Maggie Gyllenhaal is unbelievable. Because and the, and the thing that popped into my head, and maybe, I don't know, like, uh, I, I, now I'm stepping into a minefield, but I have to do it because I'm just trying to step into a minefield. That's, this movie is a minefield. So. It's like, it is. Could you make, and I always ask this, and it's a dumb question I'm going to, <laughs> uh, I don't feel like you can make it today. Oh, you totally could. You think so? I sure. Don't know. I mean, yeah. you know, give they me, made. Give me a reason why. Well, okay, they made the Fifty Shades of Grey movies, which suck. Mm-hmm. And in those, those are the bad version of this. Yeah, I think you totally. I think this actually ages super well because it is so clear that this is her story. She is the one in control the entire time. Yes, if you made it today, you would have an intimacy coordinator on that site. Um, yeah. That did not exist in 2002. That only came about in the last five years. So that's a big difference. But I definitely, at least I really hope you can make it today. (laughs) Um, I think you could. I would. I would say, like, uh, so first off, the kind of biggest, obviously the, the one of the centerpieces of the film is the spanking scene, Mm -hmm. right? And that is you know meant to i think especially for anybody that's watching any viewer that has no inclinations or even has much of any knowledge or maybe they have inclinations but they don't know it yet of uh, for you know that kind of sex life uh watches that and immediately you feel like wait like is this i mean i i, I have to feel like even though i perhaps didn't feel it as much as when i watched it at 19 but still having that moment at least in the beginning of the scene and being like I'm trying to figure out if this is consensual and maybe that's my own male gaze and like trying to understand a relationship that is part of a world and part of a fantasy that I don't necessarily have or share. Mm -hmm. And yet by the end of that scene, and especially with what comes next and like the montage of, you know, their blossoming, uh, uh, romantic relationship, it becomes clearer and clearer. Like you said, Amanda, where it's like, uh, and it, I just feel it's the same thing with the self mutilation. And the only thing that I have reservations about is is still the fact that there is a a, a guy behind the camera. And this guy, Stephen Shaneberg, mm-hmm. is I I I, I he, what has he done much of anything since then? Because I'm not sure what the yeah I don't know his <laughs> career that well. I know the screenwriter's right. career better. You're right. I yes. would probably have a woman do it now exactly yeah and i i'll admit actually when i as i mentioned at the the opening i made an erotic thriller recently um Mm -hmm. obviously secretary is not an erotic thriller it is an erotic movie though and it is very much about that cat and mouse power play and it's almost a two-hander so this was actually a movie that my uh director and i talked about a lot before we went Mm -hmm. because i i wrote the script i starred in it um and I it just became connected with this woman, Lauren Greenhall, who's a director, and she's amazing. And she came on board. Um, and so before we went into rehearsals and everything, this was something we talked about so many times about just, do we think the couple in the movie we were making, are they kinky? Would they admit they're kinky? Or is it something that they yeah. are, but like don't use language for? And so this was really, and I think we have a couch scene where we even borrowed a shot from it. So huh. this really was something that we talked about so many times when we were making our own project. Yeah. In and terms there's of also like the, the woman's gaze. And I, and I think that the, that those conversations are important between cast and crew. And I feel like there is perhaps that missing one of the um, interviews Maggie Gyllenhaal gave a couple years ago, uh, looking back on the film was about that, uh, kind of, um, 
I, I guess you would call it a form of method acting that yeah. was happening behind the scenes between her and James Spader, where Spader was basically trying to reenact that power dynamic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah. And he's That's a 42 year old man and he's in, a, she's in her twenties mm-hmm. and relatively new to the industry. Uh, and she, yeah. And she was in the dark about that. Like she didn't understand what that was that he was doing some moments treating her very closely and intimately and mm-hmm. some moments completely disregarding her. And that's why you a- have an if... intimacy coordinator. Exactly. Yeah. You absolutely cannot do that. You need to be out of the scene. You cannot yeah. traumatize right. your co-star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a big no. So <laughs> I feel like those traces of that problematic nature uh, are still lie there. But I think ultimately, as we talk through this, I think I agree with Amanda, Dan, that like, yeah. it, it could be made today. It would just be under way different circumstances. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess... What I meant by that wasn't necessarily the the subject matter or kind of the final result. I guess what I meant was that, like, um, back then in it was 2002, you know, this had to go through, you know, it's an indie film. Mm-hmm. But, like, indie mm-hmm. films cost a lot of money. This one cost, what, like, 14? Not It was not cheap. No. It was, Four million it bucks. got Lionsgate distribution. Yeah. So, it, it, I guess it's, like... With the current environment, you know, thinking about like um, that power dynamic and thinking about an older man. Um, right. Yeah. That's you know, the part, too. That's the, the part where guy. I'm sort of like, I don't <laughs> think that it would, I don't think it would get greenlit. I don't think someone would say, like, oh, hey, um, I'm happily going to put multiple. <laughs> Nowadays, it would probably be like a $10 million budget. Uh-huh. Like, I'm not going to put that into this. But then, yeah, with the sort of Fifty Shades of Grey, that's a really good point. <laughs> but like, but that that was so watered down and lame. This was real, right? So- and I'm like, this is like, <laughs> like uh, it, this feels a little bit more like um, authentic. Uh, um, I would say my movie is an age gap relationship as well. Oh, really? <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so apparently, you can make this movie the again. same age gap too. Actually, <laughs> interesting. Um, <laughs> I think actually it's yes, it's intentional. It's a part of the story. It is. It's it's not a it's a very different story. As I said, it's an erotic thriller. Um, But and it is, you know, the woman's perspective. And it's more a younger woman returning to this much older man she's been with since she was 19 and realizing that it's not a healthy relationship. Um, yeah. yeah, So it is looking at it from a different perspective and, and kind of returning when you are older and saying, Oh boy, this is bad. It's also something that is incredibly sexy and I'm still turned on by. And how do you reconcile the two? Mm, Exactly. And I think think it's the messiness of female sexuality. And that's the other piece that really stood out to me. Uh, was this i i really did feel discomfort and not necessarily in a um intentional way Mm -hmm. of the moment in the film where james spader mr gray Mm -hmm. once again like is that a coincidence um but he (laughs) he says uh to maggie gyllenhaal that like he commands her like he's you you are going to stop cutting yourself Mm -hmm. and like that I don't, maybe I just need, I need to parse that out. I'm curious what you guys think. Mm-hmm. Like, and then she like literally doesn't like, she throws her, she finally after, you know, multiple attempts after this, uh, power of suggestion from her well, new no, lover, it's just subverting yep. her will to someone else. Mm-hmm. Right? Like it's definitely uncomfortable. That's messy. That's it's it's really messy. squeaky. It is very yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah. I don't yeah, think there's messy. a way I mean, to make it not uncomfortable to be honest. But I think that's sure. the that's the thing I think about the film that works so much. It's an mm-hmm. exploration, right? Yeah. There's no thesis statement here whatsoever. No. It's an it's exploration sort of a, on her terms. Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? And I think that that's to purpose, me where yeah. what to me is aged so well, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it feels like is really, if anything, gotten more like a minefield now. Mm-hmm. Where it's like it, it's pure exploration in art and film, especially the sexuality side. Um, I don't know. It seems like it's almost like more controversial now than it, than it was back then. I don't know. Am I, I don't am I necessarily think ass? you're. No, I don't necessarily think you're wrong. I think, and I, 
was reading an interview actually with the screenwriter kind of about when she started writing and how puritanical it was in regards to what she wanted to write and the kind of sexuality she wanted to write, which, and this was in the eighties. And that's true. That was a very big kind of regressive pushback against the free love of the seventies. So then it kind of changed. And I do think to some degree we've gotten kind of back to a place where there are a lot of people who really don't want these sort of quagmires. Yeah. But I think for a lot of people, sexuality and what they fantasize about not necessarily what they're going to act on but just the way people fantasize and what sexuality is is messy and people have fantasies that are bonkers and i i think it's okay to explore that and i think what you have to do today is you know have sensitivity readers if you are writing about bdsm and kink actually have it read by people who are in those communities, have intimacy coordinators on set, have closure practices to make sure that your actors are in an environment where they feel safe and that they're okay with what is going on. Um, Yeah. And do you think, okay, so, I mean, we're, we're, we're heading towards our end point. I'm (laughs) curious before we do final thoughts, what is, like, is there, is there a threshold here? Because like the, the thing that we keep coming back to, and we talked about this a little bit with the Badlands episode and, uh, our, our, our guest Lillian and I talked about this with regards to Poison Ivy, mm-hmm. um, because at some point, is there a tipping point where we look back on these films and see the mistakes that they've made that we would not make if we were going to do something similar or try to explore similar territory today in filmmaking and still, like, at what point do we throw, what's the term? Throw the water out with the baby, whatever? Oh, the baby out with the bath water. Bath water. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. <laughs> um, because, like, when we went back and looked at Lolita, obviously, <laughs> we were like, okay, Surely, no, uh, shouldn't have ever happened. Look, I've read um, six times. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, when do we see that? Like, I don't, oh, I was, the, you can't do it. You can never do it. Right? You can never you, do it. Even with Lolita... You know, we talked about that. Yeah, you know, there's a hugely, pro- like, uh, massive amounts of problems with that film yeah. across the board. Oh, yeah. But, like, to truly engage with it, you can't excise any part of the film. Mm-hmm. No, you mm-hmm. have to do the whole, you have to talk about the whole thing. And and the changes that the film made from the book, which I completely yeah. understand why the book could not actually be turned into a film as it is. Though the movie does romanticize the relationship a lot more. And in the book, it's, it's very apparent that this is not a positive relationship, no, but that you are reading the, the words of a terrible person. Yeah. Which and you you're supposed to loathe him as you read it, but you are also being made complicit. Exactly. Mm-hmm. What's what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, I think there's not really uh, a point where we can say, well, you know, this person did X, Y, Z, therefore, all of this film is no longer worth talking about. Mm-hmm. Right. I just, I doesn't, I don't, there isn't really a line for me personally. There really isn't a line. Now that doesn't mean I don't hate certain films. Like right. are, <laughs> dude, <laughs> I could have made you watch Hannibal uh, or cannibal Holocaust oh, God. Right, for <laughs> self-aware horror. I could have made yeah, you do that. We, 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 did. we watched last house on the left anyways, but yeah. that's a perfect example. Uh, that's right. a painful last house one. on the left. Painful Here's movie, a movie yeah. that is, kind of despicable Mm -hmm. but at the same time there's so much to explore and discuss with it that it's still something to actually engage you know i mean that's the entire point of that film is like don't look away yeah right and so Mm -hmm. like it's but you're right it it feels weird sometimes and it feels very uncomfortable and it's just Um, amazing that like we're we're in the 2000s like we're we're 50 years into uh, this subgenre of like purposely trying to be risque with romantic stories and you're, you're still seeing that. So I am curious and I, I mean, I've seen the chatter, but uh, Dan, you and I are going to watch bones and all next week for, yes. our, oh. uh, for, our finale. for our finale and look at also Spike Jones's her, which is a different kind of mm-hmm. uh minefield um <laughs> but it's it's just ama- like this you'd think as you said dan like it and you were kind of saying this about like 70s and 80s uh amanda where it's like mm-hmm. this constant roller coaster of 
puritanism to liberalism to and like yeah. we're just con- we're always on some crest of that wave yeah no, personally always. i love a good messy sexy minefield oh yeah yeah it's called perfectly good moment that's right. Okay. Yeah, so not uh, sexy, sexy, messy minefield. That you'll uh-huh. save that for another <laughs> Yes, film. exactly. Okay. Yeah, no, you can watch the trailer. Uh, that's the website, IMDb, Twitter, Instagram, everything. <laughs> and then what's your plan for it? Trying to get, get it into festivals? Yeah, that's the goal. Get into some festivals and get distribution through that. Um, you know, find ourselves an audience that way. Uh, I, I did mention intimacy coordinators a lot. We worked with one. So. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was. They're amazing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, get it, get into festivals and, you know, have talkbacks. I think it's something that a lot of people will talk about when they watch. And I yeah. also think a lot of women will relate to it. And that's kind of the feedback we got when we were sending around our rough cut before we moved on to color and sound editing. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. That's fantastic. Well, I'm it. excited to see it. Yeah. I'm excited um, to show it to people. <laughs> absolutely thank you so much for joining us amanda yeah this was a blast i had so that much to say <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful you've been you've been a great guest thank you uh, and then we will close out this cycle uh with bones and all next week thanks for listening this has been film trace